For the rest of us, we're going to continue uh, taking a look this this morning in the Gospel of John, this ancient account of this person, Jesus Christ, as we await and we talk about waiting for Christmas and, and waiting uh, for this birth of Jesus. Here we look at, at the reflections of one of his first and longest followers who, who actually walked on this earth with him because John so desperately wants us to see who Jesus is, what his coming means in our world and in our lives in knowing who God is. So I invite you this morning, uh, I'm going to read from John chapter 9, and we will, we will read the whole chapter. So let's uh, hear, sit back and, and listen as we hear of how Jesus dealt with the people on earth. John chapter 9. As he passed by, Jesus saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and he made mud with the saliva. And he anointed the man's eyes with the mud, and he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. And so they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? But he said, I do not know. They brought him to the Pharisees. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind And now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him again, asked again, asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud in my eyes. I washed and now I see. But some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know how his eyes, who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? And how did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I've told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born in utter sin. And would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him, that they had cast him out. 
And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things, and they said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. Father, as we come to this text and this story of works that you did so long ago, Father, I pray that by your spirit you would give them, uh, give our minds and our hearts, our ears and our, our, our whole bodies, Lord, uh, insight into just who you are and just who you desire for your people to be in this earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this uh, recently I was uh, uh, listening to a, a, a link that I came across on the internet, and it was a, a Christian leader who was uh, giving his, his two cents on uh, this current I- impeachment drama that's unfolding in our country, right? You all know about the impeachment hearing. Um, and, and as I listened to this, this person give his, his take, I, I felt a familiar feeling. Maybe you've felt the same. I, I felt this, this burning frustration and this, this burning anger build up inside of me as he not so much at his political views that he was expressing, but the way that he was invoking the scriptures, the way that he was invoking the Lord's name for his own prophet. As I listened to more and more as he explained his case, my anger and my frustration build. You're, you, you don't know that. You're making false claims. That is completely wrong. He continued on, and, and, and I just could not get past this fixation. You, you're, you're, you're just saying this because it gives you power. You're saying this because it, it gives you a platform. He went on, I said, hey, you're, you're willing to, to throw away all of the gospel. You're willing to throw away our whole country for the sake of your own gain. How awful could you be? And as I sat there uh, in frustration and, and anger and bitterness at this man, I, I, I pondered in my brain, it, ought I now consider him a false teacher? If you've read the New Testament, you hear of these these men who come and they, they peddle the gospel for profit, but they don't peddle what God says. They peddle what they say. And, and as I built in my frustration and my anger and as I blacklisted this man, I slowly came. I was like, no, i got to work on my sermon, right? And so I turned to, to an article that I had printed off because uh, I thought it would relate perhaps to, to the, the subject matter for our text this morning. And I came across this line from, from Tim Keller. As he explained those who, who falsely have a false notion of what the gospel is, and he says one of the ways that you identify them is that they have a, quote, constant need to find fault, a constant need to win arguments and to prove that all opponents are not just mistaken, but dishonest sellouts. And then went back to what I was just saying in my brain and the notes that I had scribbled of, of why this man ought to be considered a, a false teacher. And as I heard Tim Keller tell me what my emotions were, And as I heard Tim Keller say that this are symptoms of a false conception of the gospel, my heart wondered what is going on with me. 
You see, Tim Keller, he, he argues uh, that this is, is a symptom, that it is a, a fruit of what he calls a, a, a natural overflow of moral performance identity or, or moralism. The view that you uh, get value in your life by being right, by being correct, by being the one who has it together. And, and there's religious forms of this and there's irreligious forms of this. But, it, but in the religious forms, in the Christian forms of it, right, we say that we can attract God because of our rightness. Because we've thought the right way. Because we've done the right things. Because we associate with the right kinds of people. He says that God will accept us based upon how right we are. Martin Luther argued that this was the default condition of the human heart. And, and if you've had an experience like me over the last few weeks, maybe I wonder if that's where some of our anger is coming from. As we look forward to this Christmas holiday and gathering with, with friends and as we uh, get ready to, to feel the kinds of feelings when a politics right, come up or when religion comes up at the dinner table, when the snide remarks about your Presbyterian church or perhaps a snide remark that you go to any sort of church at all, Right When there's snide remarks on the decisions that you've made in your life or the decisions that you ought to be making in your life and your anger and your frustration and your whole being pulses with anger, I wonder if there's something in how we view the world that's not quite right. I'm guessing I'm not the only one here who's felt that. I'm guessing that maybe, just maybe, some of what we're feeling in this moment is not the righteous anger, but of righteous self-protection, right? The protection of our self-righteousness. As we come to this text in John 9, we come to this text where there is this boiling pot of anger and resentment at the person of Jesus Christ. And it is, it is boiling over, it is spilling over all throughout the world as they watch as Jesus interacts with this man and they are convinced that he could not be more wrong. But also in this text, we get to see something else. We get to see not just this poisonous fruit of, of moral identity, but we get to see its antidote. We get to see the antidote of what pushes us back, pushes us out of a sense of worth based upon being right. And it pushes us back into those who get it, those who see Jesus. And that antidote is God's mercy. The antidote to the moralism that, that pushes the Pharisees to, to kill and to revile Jesus, the antidote to that is an experience, an encounter with the mercy of Jesus. So we're going to take a look here uh, at, a, at a number of things that an encounter with mercy breaks us free from. I'm going to argue that it breaks us free from a blame game. It breaks us free from uh, the trap of being right. It breaks us free from thinking that we're better than others. And ultimately, it breaks us free from our own spiritual blindness. So starting here with mercy breaks us free from the blame game. In the beginning of the story, we see the disciples, and as they walk with Jesus, they see this man who was blind. A man who, by reputation, they know had always been blind. And they're Conception, their worldview had been uh, conditioned in them such that they thought there must be an explanation for this. There must be a, a cause. There must be a reason why this man suffers in this way that I do not. And so they asked what is in many ways an obvious question to them, their way of seeing the world. They ask, who sinned? Who screwed up? Who messed up in such a way that God had to inflict this upon this Man, is it his sin or is it his parents? Who do we blame, him or his mom, him or his dad? Or maybe it was his granddad. But Jesus answers them 
with a surprising twist. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, the, 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 when our brains are, are focused on being right, we have these encounters with the brokenness of our world, with sickness, disease, and death, and we have to find an explanation, right? We have to assign blame to something, something else because in assigning blame to someone else, we assign innocence on ourselves. To assign blame for this bad thing on somebody else allows us to take a step back, to, to remove ourselves from the messiness of the situation. It allows us to withdraw into a safe distance where we can maintain our innocence, where we can maintain our, our lack of engagement, a, 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 an ability to not see the realities of the hurting. Because the moralist's number one concern is to protect their innocence, to protect their reputation, to protect their knowledge. And so when they see a man who is, who, who is physically handicapped, a man who is, who is suffering this life as a beggar because of his, thi- of, of, of his blindness, they must put him into a category, they must regulate him in a way that they don't have to respond. Maybe not so much unlike how we might view the, the needy in our midst, the needy that surrounds us. And we want to answer the question, well, why? Why do they not have a home? Why are they out of money? And we want to assign blame because assigning blame allows us to remove ourselves from the situation. When Uncle Joe uh, tells us and laments of the causes and woes of our country, we want to assign blame to Uncle Joe and say, well, why did you vote for so-and-so and and why did you do this? Because by blaming him, it means that we haven't done something wrong. But mercy, an encounter with mercy reorients ourselves where the question when we see the pain and the suffering and the brokenness is not who did it, but who will help. You hear Jesus' words. He says this, that the works of God might be displayed to him, but for we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Because mercy isn't viewing life through the prism of who got it right, but through the prism of who will make it right. Mercy breaks us free from the blame game, the shame game, but it does more. Mercy breaks us free from the the I'm right trap, the I'm right trap. You see, there's this predictable uh, sort of of formula, this this, series of assumptions, the series of actions that these leaders take out uh, against Jesus and against this man. To, to, to confirm to themselves, we got it right all along. The, the lengths that they will go to to convince themselves that they have not made a mistake. You see, they come to the knowledge of, of this, this uh, beggar or, or this former beggar, this man who was born blind as he is brought to them. And, and this is deeply concerning to them, right? Because they've already decided that Jesus is the antithesis to what is good and right in the world. So, so when these people bring this beggar and they say, he says Jesus healed him, they have a huge problem. How could this man who they are opposed to bring life and healing? So the first part of their formula is that they must find a fault, right? They must find something that Jesus has done that is wrong. And so they uh, arbitrarily point out to us here that it was on a Sabbath day. Now, in the Gospel of John, we've seen Jesus bring healings on the Sabbath day a a few different times, actually. But here, the, the narrator doesn't bring it up until he gets to this point, almost like he's trying to point out just how arbitrary of the detail it is because it was simply an excuse an excuse for these pharisees to look at jesus and say this man is a sinner he made somebody whole on the sabbath (gasps) 
But they didn't just find a fault that they could pick out, a, 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 a detail that they could argue was, was why they discounted the whole act of redemption. Instead, they, they then pursued on. They, they regressed into finding a way to, to try and reject the claim altogether. Not just was this proposed uh, action wrong, now we bring into question whether it ever happened to begin with, right? Are we sure that this is the man? Are we sure that this is the man? Are we sure that their neighbors got it right? Let's bring in the parents. Let's, let's find the parents of this supposed man and make sure that, that he is really born blind. Maybe he's just been pretending all these years, right? Maybe this is a identity confusion. They kind of look alike, but they're a little bit different. They're searching. They're scrambling. They're trying to find a way to say Jesus has not done what Jesus has said because they must be right. Their need to be right was so strong that they're willing to doubt what was evidentiary true, what was obviously true. Finally, when, when the parents come and they say, yeah, that is the guy. And yes, we are 100% he was born blind. You can see in the parents' reaction their next step. It's not just that they dismiss it for a fault or that they reject the claim, but they then pursue to suppress any opposing evidence. Because fear and intimidation are always the hallmarks of those who suppress the truth. Parents are afraid to say it was Jesus. The parents are afraid for their own safety, and they say, look, we'll tell you he's our son, but we're not going to be on the hook for anything that he says. Because these people had to be right. Because they had to be right so much that they would lie. They had to be right so much that they would intimidate and, and hide the truth because they so desperately needed to be right. It closed a trap. They turned being right into an act of warfare where, where anything goes, where there's no holds bar on, on what can is acceptable, even lying so that they could can preserve the truth. Not even God can get in their way. But the man who was born blind, the man who has conditioned himself not based upon the narrative of, of moralism, of what he does to make himself worthy, but the man whose view of the world is shaped by an act of mercy, an unparalleled act of mercy, responds with this, with this simple antidote. Look, I don't know the details, right? I don't know whether he is a sinner. I don't know who he is, but one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. The ones who claimed most fervently that they knew the truth were the ones who missed what happened. And the one who was able to say freely, I don't know, but this is what I do. He was the one who was able to stand corrected. The one who was able to see the truth. The one who was free to respond to what God was doing. And so we have this paradoxical uh, situation where those who yell God's name most loudly in the temple are the ones who are completely unavailable to respond to his tremendous act of mercy. Mercy breaks us free from the trap that we must be right and that we will pursue being right to any and extraordinary end but it also breaks us free from something else. As the story progresses, we see uh, these Pharisees and how they interact with this man. And we see now not only that, they, uh, that this man has been broken free from the blame game or been broken free from the, the compulsory need to be right, but that mercy has also broken him free from a, a, a need to be better than others. Have you ever known that uh, moralistic people can sometimes feel like they're better than other people? 
right? It's the name of the game. It's their very identity is, is to look down on other people, right? Just as you would, um, just as, as, as you have blamed somebody for some bad event, right? And as you have, have created an entire narrative to confirm your own rightness, well, then, of course, you must look at the other people as they're being less than, right? They're the ones who caused the hurt. They're the ones who are proclaiming something which you're sure is wrong. Of course, they must be less than, and that's exactly what we find. The disdain that they have for this poor, uneducated man was palpable, right? In verse 28, they said to him, and they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. You have been misled, but we are are the right ones. In verse 34, they say, you were born in utter and complete sin. How dare you think that you can talk to us? The moral self-identity must look down on others because there is no other way to feel of worth. There's no other way to feel in charge. There's no other way to say they're right. This isn't exactly a, a novel revelation, right? Like, there is no place like church where you are more aware of the desire to, to, to run away and to hide, right? There's one thing, if, if the church has one reputation, it's a place that you are looked down upon, right? That you are scorned for the things that are inadequate in you, the the things that have messed up. And so it leads many to never come through the front door. And it causes many of us who sit in here to hide the, the sins that are pervasive in our life because we are 100% sure that if they were known, we would be scorned. But what about if a church wasn't based upon moralism, but was based upon the founding act of great mercy? What if the people who gathered in this room were not a collection of people who were right all the time, but exactly the opposite of people who were wrong all the time, wrong in their deeds, wrong in their thoughts? What if we were a people who viewed the world through the lens of those who have received great mercy? We no longer have to think we were better by shifting blame and, and claiming to be right. But healing would be possible because we would take a look at those around us, that we would take a look at ourselves and we would say, healing is available for you. Take me as an example. In the text, the man who is born blind, he his, his frustration is, is evident, but it's interesting when they bring him back again the second time, right? And they begin to come back and to inquire of him the same things. And he, he says, I've already told you all these things and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? I don't know about you, but the, 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 it's hard to tell exactly his tone of voice. But, but the way that I, I tend to read that is like he's, he's, he's you know, giving a little pointer, right? He's stirring the pot a little bit. But what he's pointing out is something that Jesus is going to come back to at the end of this. The difference between the moralist who looks down on others is that those who they look down on can never come to their level. But the, but the person who views the world through God's acts of mercy has always says, even when they are rejected, even when they're in the midst of a hostile exchange like this, they're saying, look, you can come with me. You can be on my level as a disciple of Jesus. There is an offer implicit, even as he points at their side with a, a, a little gotcha moment, he's declaring something to them, right? Because mercy has no pretense. Mercy is available for all. So mercy breaks us free from the blame game. Mercy breaks us from the I'm right trap. Mercy breaks us from the need to be better than others, but mercy breaks us free from the curse of spiritual blindness. This story ends in this 
fascinating exchange that Jesus comes and he finds this man, a man who he had physically healed previously, who has then been, been pushed out, sent out of the synagogue, unable to, to gather with the people of God anymore. And he comes to him and he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Son of Man? And when the man understands that it's Jesus who he is talking to, he f- believes and he worships. And then Jesus says this curious phrase, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. All throughout well, there, this, this narrative, we, we have two groups of people. We have the man who could not see, who is able to to know who Jesus is. And there's the people who have reiterated over and over and over again the phrase, I know, I get it, I'm right. And what Jesus says here is that the end is that they are left in their blindness. See, when Jesus says, um, for judgment I came into this world, Jesus is saying when the light comes into the room, there's only two ways to respond to the light. You can either see by it or you can hide from it, right? That there is a, a, a direct and immediate pressing cause here. The Pharisees who are there listening to him, they say, well, now, wait a second. Are you saying that, that we're blind? Are you saying that, that we have have we fall into this category of those who can't make sense of the world, of those who are, are spiritually ignorant. And Jesus says this fascinating phrase here in verse 41, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. If you understood that you were blind, then guilt would be lifted from you because grace could be extended to you. If you knew that you could not see, if you would uh, consent to the fact that this is all a ruse, if you would consent to the fact that you are desperately needy, if you would consent to the fact that you've been playing the blame game, that you've been trying to protect yourself, that you've been looking down at others, if you could acknowledge that, it's the blind people that the light has come to heal. It's the blind ones who will regain their sight. Those who think they can see before the light comes, they are the ones who, who like when you, you walk out in the morning to a bright light and, or someone flips on the light in your bedroom and you, you shirk and you, you hide, you cover your face because, you have, uh, because the light hurts. The light is, is painful. And so Jesus is saying to them, you are, are in blindness because you think you can see. But if you were blind, you could have no guilt. If you were blind, then healing could be had for you. So how do we, as we look at this text, as we hear Jesus say, if you are blind, then you can see how, how is it that we recover our blindness? I think one of the things that this text is laying out for us is it's showing us this ugly, messy picture of how this moralistic self-identity leads them not just into lies, but into the persecution of those who spoke truth. The blame game, right? The, the, the trap of, of feeling right or, or needing to be right. The feeling of being better than someone else. And those are things that, that you and, and I see in our life too. And when we see those things, it should hearken in our ears. We should hear the voice of Jesus saying, if you were blind, if you were blind, then you would have no guilt. Because when we, when we are doing those things, when we find ourselves blaming others for the problems, when we find ourselves trying to be right, what we are saying in ourselves is, I can see. I know the truth. And the people who think they know, the people who think they see, are the ones who reject Jesus. The second thing, though, is not just when we see the the glimpse of these decay of moralism, 
but also when we, in these next few weeks, catch a glimpse of that manger scene. Catch a glimpse of the manger scene, and we see this little tiny baby set in a nativity scene, right? I mean, it's so easy to think of it as, as being a, a culture, right? An icon, a tradition. Maybe it is a, a sense of rallying cry to you to pursue uh, some sort of Christian agenda in the world. But first and foremost, when we see that baby, we should see our Savior. To see a baby, an infant, so harmless, so, uh, so weak and frail ought to remind us of just how desperate we are that even that little baby can be our salvation. When we view Jesus, when we tell the Christmas story, it's a cry to our heart that you are not okay by yourself, but that you need a savior. If there's one thing that can give an antidote to the crushing life of moralism, it is the display of Christ's mercy in his coming. And so I invite us as we uh, go from here until Christmas morning to dwell on that gift, to dwell on the identity of him as a savior, to proclaim it, to sing of it, to, to eat of it together, that we are recipients of a great mercy, of a great kindness. And he, and he alone, is our life. Pray with me. Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we respond with joy that the coming of, of the end of our blindness is found in you. Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts of where we have gone back, where we have reverted to the default mode of trying to justify ourselves, where we have sought truth by making up our own rightness. And Lord, let us instead be humbled by the act of your great mercy and see our world anew in its light. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.